Hi everyone, it's finally time to review Coffee Lake. Is it really just the 7700K with six cores and 12 threads? Okay then peeps, so it is finally time to talk about the 8700K, the eighth generation Intel uh, kind of mainstream processor really, which for the first time this year, or for the first time this generation, has six cores and 12 threads. Now there's a lot of stuff that I am just going to talk to you about in my normal fashion. We have a lot of graphs to show you as well because a lot of testing has been done. I've actually waited to film the CPU review because I now have tested a lot of other boards as well so I can add kind of little nit bits in about what I found because I did do the initial testing on the Z370A Prime board. Now I always use the Prime board and it can be sometimes a little limiting and the reason why I choose it and when I say limiting it's because of um, it is kind of early days, but it is one of the kind of lower end of the segment. Now I know a lot of people will go, well, I'm not gonna buy that board. Well, I can never please everyone. So what I end up doing is I use the Prime because it's a lower end board. And then when I review uh, the other boards, which I do do a lot of, I'm not one of these kind of reviewers that you know just builds a system and tests the CPU once. I mean, I mean I'll show you, okay? So this is the amount of stuff that I have to do for Coffee Lake. I mean, we can pile them all up if you want. And this is just what's here at the moment. I'm expecting more. So when I say I am a reviewer, I review a lot of stuff. Now at launch, you are going to be able to see, so we're doing the CPU review here today. But on the channel with full reviews, you are going to be able to see the Gigabyte Gaming 7, which is there, the MSI Godlike Gaming, which is there. You're gonna be able to go and see the Maximus Hero 10 as well. We're gonna do previews on all the other boards. Um, this review has been done on the Prime, and then there are going to be the other reviews when my sanity kind of returns and I get time and around all the other stuff that I have to do. But we're, we, as always, we do a lot of boards um, and that's why our graphs end up quite meaty. So there's a lot of stuff going on. So this time around, the 8700K. Now price, we'll talk about price to start off with. Now this has been a little confusing and I will say to Intel, when it comes to price, you cannot send us stuff to review when no one knows a price. We have a price that's been kind of published, but the price that's been published, unless that is actually gonna be an RRP, is the price that they're saying for shops that buy a thousand of the units. It's, it's kind of nuts. We just need a, this is the RRP or this is the MSRP because the price that I, the only number that I've got so far from Intel is $369. But then I have heard a retailer in the UK, because of checking with vendors and stuff, is gonna be selling it at 350. I then spoke to overclockers and they thought, well, they're not 100% sure whether theirs is gonna be a little bit more or not, because there aren't gonna be many of them. Now, there aren't gonna be many of them. I can kind of explain that in a minute as well. So we're gonna go with, that we think that it might be somewhere between 350 GBP and 370 GBP, which I don't think in the grand scheme of things is that bad a price. Now, before all the AMD boys get up and start chucking their knickers at the stage, the reason why I say that is because the 7700K at launch was 349 pounds. So if we've now got the, the six core coming in, at roughly the same sort of price, bearing in mind that you're not gonna expect something a few years later to be the exact same price, I don't think that that's that bad. But the, the other confusing thing is, is people are, that they have changed the way that the i3s, the i5s, and where the i7 stand now. So as far as I know at the moment, at least with what I know that they're going to be launching, they're not going to be doing anything that kind of matches the 7700K, because that was the four core and eight thread unit. Whereas this time, the um, the i7, so we'll say the top of the line one, is six cores and 12 threads. Then the i5 is going to be uh, six cores with no hyper threading. And then the i3 
this time around, even with overclocking, is going to be four cores. So we're not, with the i3s in the past, they were two cores and four hyper threads. So they've kind of bumped everything up a little bit. Now this opens up a lot of good conversation, debate, you know, sitting around with a mate, doing what we're doing right now. And that is, in all honesty, the i5, if it's gonna come in at the money that the i5 did before, having six threads could be an, a really good processor. Now, yet again, sit down AMD people, we will get to um, bolstering you up, don't you worry. Um, but then again, the i3, they are going to be doing an overclocking i3 as well. So essentially, you could have an overclocking i3 uh, for, uh, or it, it might have been last generation, what would have been the i5 for i3 money this time around. But then what does that mean? Does that mean we might get a Pentium with two cores and four threads? I don't know. If they're going to move everything up like that, then that is kind of cool. And I did say that we'd kind of talk about the, the AMD side of things. And that we, we have got graphs for you. Now, if, we, if we're going to have the whole, you know, um, price per punch and all of that sort of argument, then the, that's where we do need to talk about the graph. So we will get there and we will have a look. Um, uh, so, right, the, the other thing that I've heard a lot about and people have been moaning about a lot is the fact that the socket is the same but different. And it's the same because it's still got um, uh, 1,151 pins. Yes but all the pin out underneath is different. Now there is some talk about um, uh, a board online somewhere and someone's done it and it's just getting to the GPU post phase and then it's all going wibble, but it has done the initial post. Now I've not had a chance because of the amount of boards and stuff that I've done to really be able to look into it. And until someone says to me, there is a BIOS that might fix this, get around this, hacked version, I don't really see there being a lot of point in me bothering because if someone's already saying it doesn't work and it might be locked in the BIOS, by me doing it, it means I'm just gonna be saying the same sort of thing. So if, if it is BIOS, then we're just gonna to have to see if a hooky, dodgy version does come out. But I've got a funny feeling, peeps, that if there is a, a, if it is able to be hacked, it may need a private individual to do it because the reason why when we had all those kind of BIOS hacks and people turning things on and off and allowed to be, do you know what I mean, overclocking, being enabled and all that stuff in the past, the reason why that was all stopped was because Intel basically threw a paddy and put an end to it and told the motherboard manufacturers no. Now I don't know whether Intel let them do it in the first place so that it could be a little bit of a hype and people could um, have do you know what I mean? Something to play with. And there was always that BIOS out there in the wild, but you know, we're gonna have to see what happens with that. Uh, it would be kind of interesting, but the thing that I do know, and I can tell you, is that um, there's essentially, for power pin out on the Kaby Lake CPU and in the socket, there is 128. And on the Coffee Lake, there is 146. So they've increased the power pin out on the um, in the actual socket because we do have more cores going in there. I have to admit though, as I will show you in a bit, I didn't really see it using a monstrous amount of power. Not really much more than the uh, 7700K anyway. So, you know, maybe it's for stability, maybe it's for, you know, a lower end power supplies, because if you've got a crappy power supply, then you might need to make use of, you know, more of those pins or something. But, you know, it's fine. And by crappy power supply, I mean, you know, not delivering clear volts and having lo um, loads of ripple or something, because the lower your volts are, the harder that everything else is going to have to work. So, you know, th th there's a lot of things that could be said, but the like, we know that the pin out has changed. I'm not sure whether I'm meant to say or not as well. And I genuinely, at this present moment in time, I'm not sure whether I'm meant to say anything or not because it, it's been mentioned to me on a one-to-one -one basis and I can't remember whether they told me not to say in it, anything. But I happen to know that with the Z370 boards, Asus have turned on 21 pins that weren't necessarily being used in the past to help um, stabilize uh, overclocks and stuff. So it is pretty much another very, very under the table, shush, shush, hush, hush, overclock socket going on. Now with the testing that I have done, 
not really been able to analyse enough boards yet to see if there's voltage differences between them, but it's something that I'm taking screenshots beyond screenshots beyond screenshots about, so that when I can sit there and start to pick them apart, I will be able to, it's probably be something I'll do a special video on. Um, we're also, at the moment as well, something you do need to kind of keep in mind, where we are on early BIOS days as well, things are likely to get a bit better as we go through. So before we move on to the graphs, there's something else that we need to talk about, and that's in the uh, Asus BIOS, they've got this thing when you turn XMP on, uh, and it's called multi-core enhancement. So when you turn out XMP on, it'll pop up in the bar, so a little thing, and it will ask you whether you want to turn it on or off. The thing is, if you turn it on, it pretty much turns your turbo on and fixes your turbo on, which sounds brilliant. And for most people, it would be, apart from the fact if you do that, and this is where I always say to people, stock volts doesn't mean anything unless you've manually set your stock volts. Because if you turn XMP on and you turn on the multi-core enhancement, your V-core will go up to about 1.35 volts from what probably would have been about 1.15 to 1.2. Because effectively, at that point, you are auto overclocking. So it's just turning the volts up for you. So this is why I always say to you peeps, when people say to me, oh yeah, I'm running 4.5 gigahertz and I'm on stock volts. And I ask, did you manually set the volts to stock so that they can't be changed? And they're like, no, no, I just left them on auto. They're in stock. Yeah, they're not. You have to go and check because the boards, all boards, every single boards will turn the voltage up for you. And it's normally some profiles and stuff that they've saved in the background. Now, some are a lot worse than others for you know turning certain volts up and with some of the other boards that I have to review that it's that is something I do have to talk about because there's one in particular that has been absolutely raging some of the volts and I'm probably not going to be that popular when I uh, talk about that sacred board um, so yeah so uh, you can't do that so essentially we noticed um, uh, and we left it to run it, but what we've done is we've done an XMP run with the MCE on, we've done an XMP run with it off at stock. So essentially you've got one that's running 4.3, you've got one that's running 4.7, so the MCE is the 4.7 run, but you also need to think about the fact that it's putting loads of extra volts through, so when we get to the power side of it, that is why. Then I've also, uh, so, uh, also done a manual overclock. And talking about overclocking, 5 gigahertz seemed well easy, if I'm honest. Um, and I was, it was around, depending on the boards that we were using, it was around the 1.26 to 1.28 volt mark to be able to get 5 gigahertz stable. Trying to get 5.1 out of this one seems to have been incredibly hard. I've not seen any screenshots or anything yet of 5.1, but again, early BIOS, not really having a lot of time to get in there and mess around, but I would have thought on some of the later boards when we get to the meaty ones as well, you might see 5.1 screenshots or 5.1 uh, benches. As yet, you know, not too sure. Memory as well, at stock and with the MCE in this review that was done with 3200 megahertz. It was done with 3200 megahertz with just ease. So um, although it says 2666, I think is what they're saying that the, the base is, or is it 2400? I can't remember. I think it's 2666 now um, that the, you know, the stock memory is. To be honest with you, peeps, 3200 is literally just clip it in. Yes, you do need to enable XMP, but it's not difficult and all boards will do it straight away at launch. It's going above that 3200 mark. That is, that's the point when you are either going to need someone to help you or you're going to need um, quite a good board. But the thing is, when you do go above 3200, there are two volts that you have to pay specific attention to with the, um, as far as memory is concerned. So you can go in and turn XMP on. So let's say you're doing 3600 megahertz and your CPU stable and you've set your CPU volts and all your memory set up and it's all right, but then the VCC IO volts and the SA volts or the system agent volts are the ones that you're going to need to watch because they will auto wang themselves right up. Now I have seen on a, as I was trying to say before, a um, kind of hallowed 
uh, bored. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. You, you get the the kind of like um, religious reference that I'm trying to make. We were seeing almost 1.4 volts on those for uh, high memory speeds. Now you do need to go very careful. Now don't just go in there and stick 1.2 in, but you do you do need to drive those volts down as low as you possibly can do. So if, just a quick hint, what you can go in is pick one of them, so the VCC, IO or system agent volt, literally go in, turn it down a notch, restart the machine, and literally just keep doing that backwards and forwards. Yes, it does take an age. Get to a point where it's unstable, where it's not starting, go back and turn it up a little bit. Then work on the other one. Don't do them both together, because if you do them both together, you're not going to know which one is the problem. So yes, it takes a while, but I'm not being funny. If you're spending 350 quid on a CPU, or you know, if you're buying the i7, and then let's say you're gonna spend 200 pound on a motherboard, why would you not wanna set it up properly? And you could say, well, they should set it up properly for me. Well, they, they, they kind of do, but they have to do it for the worst processor on the planet and that guy that can barely work out where the start button is. So they have to think about the worst case scenario. So it's up to us as members of the PC Master Race, if we're really that bothered, and a lot of people aren't, if you want to run really high stuff, you do need to kind of <laughs> and go and take some manual intervention and go and turn it back. Now it will save you um, uh, probably quite a few degrees on temps. You may actually find that in the long run it will make your rig more stable and at the same time you might find, although it's going to be difficult to test it, that it may last a bit longer as well because it was those two volts really on the X99 platform that were picking out the weak bits of CPU silicon and causing a lot of RMA. So that's one of the reasons why I pay quite a bit of attention to this and keep an eye on it. Now it's only going to be when you use very, very quick memory. But even if you use 3200 megahertz, whatever it says it's running at, you probably will be able to turn it down even more. So that is something for you to keep in mind. Yes, I have got a tickly nose. Uh, so the first of the benchmarks up, although I could talk to you about system power draw if you want. Yeah, okay, we'll do system power draw. So we'll start with that. Now, when you see this, you can see that the MCE actually used more power. Now, the reason for that was, as I've already told you, the higher volts on that one uh, compared to the manual overclock, which, as I've said to you, five gigahertz, it was running at higher clocks at lower volts, and uh, that then turned into lower, um, uh, lower uh, power draw. With the 8700K at the bottom, you think about that was 4.3. And then the other thing that um, you, you can look at here, which is actually quite interesting, you can pick out the 1800X at 199 watts. Now, the way we do our testing is we max out all of the cores. So when you do that on a stock 1800X, it does turn all the boost and everything off and clock right back. So at that point, the 1800X was doing about 3.3 gigahertz. Um, so it's, although it's only 25 watts, I'm just trying to kind of explain to you that it does clock itself right back. So with the 8700K, for example, 225 watts, 25 watts more, but it was still doing a healthy 4.3 at that. Now, although the processor is 3.7 to 4.3 and then it does the other boosts up to 4.5 and 4.7, um, to be honest with you, we were having to, to do that stock run we were pretty much having to force it to stay at 4.3. And that's the same for all of the other tests as well. That stock run would have been 4.3. Uh, because if you leave it to kind of move all over the place, a lot of the motherboards now, and it's the motherboards issue, not the CPU, they pretty much will try and run it as quick as it possibly can do all the time. Now that's also quite complicated because in the grand scheme of things, the reason why they do that is they want to give you at home a good kind of quick and stable system but you know it has got to the point where you know some people aren't necessarily paying attention to the speeds that their cpu are running and it can change reviews a little bit as well and that's across the board every single brand does it uh, so if you leave it all at stock a lot of the boards will be running 4.5 to 4.7 the majority of the time with the mce that will be running at 4.7, so that's just enable an XMP does that. Um, and like I said, it's been the same with all of the boards as well. It's just kind of commonplace now. 
So w the way we have to do it with our testing is we have to keep an eye on it and make sure that we're doing it this way. And we treat the boards all very um, fairly as well. So when we test the other boards going out from this and when we do the go into just the Z370 board graphs, they will all be tested the same way as well. Now, I know I might be kind of like waffling on about little tiny things, but there's always that one guy in the comments that goes on about not testing stuff fairly. And with all due respect, I spend such a lot of time trying to make sure everything is tested so just crazily fairly that, you know, it's worth mentioning maybe once or twice. So power draw, I think it did all right. I was expecting a lot more in the grand scheme of things. And if you were to go in there and look for the 7700K, for example, um, it does... It, it, it was about 50 watts more, which is about right when you think about the extra cores and stuff. But um, if you like, if you, you when you, you can, and we did, uh, undervolt it. Now, the, uh, if you undervolt it, we got it running on all six cores at like 1.05 volts, and you can take a massive chunk off of that. Again, so that was it. Um, we did that one at four gigahertz, just to give us a round number. And then the power draw on that then was about 150 watts. It was, it was quite insane, and the temps were like fully loaded. They were like high 50s. It was, um, yeah, it was interesting. Uh, so then Blender. So Blender, really, we love doing this, and it's a custom uh, OC 3D Blender run that we do now. It's three million polygons, absolutely smashes the CPU to within an inch of its life. And we do a 4K one and we do a 1080p one. The 1080p one is obviously the smaller number in there, and the 4K one is the one that really can stress the bejesus. Even the top of the graph, that bench is um, almost 12 minutes long, and you can see at the bottom there's the other one. 151 minutes, you know what I mean? That was one when we went off and went out for dinner when we did that. But they kind of sit midships. But the one to have a look at here is you can see that the 1800X, that's the 1800X RT. Now that was the, ret uh, the retest stuff that I did. So it was the literally the last time that I tested the uh, 1800Xs. Uh, there's been no big changes or anything since. Uh, but it, it <coughs> the six cores does mix quite well with the eights from the Ryzen. So keep an eye on those in the graphs. Now it is kind of easy to talk about the 1800X because it is the flagship. But if I'm completely honest with you, I've never really seen the point in the 1800X unless you're not gonna overclock and you're just hell bent on, you know, wanting to be lazy and just flip it all in together. But again, if you're a member of the PC Master Race and you, you wanna do a little bit of manual overclocking and you wanna set your system up and you wanna run quick memory, why wouldn't you save a lot of money and buy the 1700 and manually overclock it yourself? Or get a mate round to do it? Or watch one of my videos which teaches you how to do it because it's really not that difficult. And it's really that 1700 processor that kind of trips up the whole 8700K uh, argument about the 1800X. But we might save that for the conclusion. Move on to the X265 benchmark. It sits in roughly the same sort of place here as well. But this is one of the graphs where we, because we've not tested the 1700 on Blender. Uh, Blender's a relatively new bench that we've added in and I've not had a chance to get back and run it. But if you have a look here with the, where the 1700 sits, it's just above that stock 8700K. And you know, this is where we do start talking about price, the performance. HEVC decode, this one's a bit different. You know, the, 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 for whatever reason, this one does favor the Intel stuff. Now, this is a meaty, meaty graph. You can see, no, it's that side, Tom. That side, no, that, 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 that side. I need, yeah, see, I'm not very good at this back to front stuff. Anyway, that side. Um, <laughs> uh, I'll bring it up and zoom it in. But when you look at the first graph, it's more about the, what they are. So the black is Total Warhammer, gray is Rise of the Tomb Raider, red is the Gears of War CPU render, and the white is the Gears of War um, GPU render. Now, well, what I would say about this is the Gears of War CPU render, it will favor both cores and core speed. So if you think about that, if it favors both cores and core speed, that is why Intel does quite well because they're normally the core speed is significantly higher. Doesn't matter what processor you look at. I mean, you can see the i5 6500 in there is above an overclocked 1800X. So big graph out on the, uh, uh, what would it be, your right hand side. I'd pretty much discount that 
Look at the little ones because it is the little numbers that are most interesting. And as I said before, pause, go and have a look. Or what you could probably do, which would be even better, would be go and have a look on the OC3D website where you can actually go and see the massive graph and pick it apart yourself. Because the differences between some of those, I mean, I would even be saying to you, go and have a look at some of the differences between the um, Ryzen 5 1600X and the 8700K or even some of the other Intels, if I'm honest. And then we get back to Blender. So we've spoken a lot about memory and all that sort of stuff, although I didn't probably give you enough info about memory. Um, we tested with this, in this review specifically, we found the A to be a little bit limiting with memory speeds, 3200 megahertz. Now we can get it to run faster, and this is another place where a lot of people fall over is we can get it to run faster, but in actual reality, the performance dropped off. Now that is a board and a BIOS issue because now from testing the other boards, and we are quite a few boards in now, we are now seeing um, 3866 and above being possible. It's pretty much board specific and how good the IMC is on your CPU. It's exactly the same as what Z270 was before. So if you think you're gonna buy this uh, processor and you're gonna go and buy 4,000 megahertz memory, click, click, XMP, you're gonna need a really good board and a really good technical eye to be able to turn those VCC IO and system agent voltages down because in the grand scheme of things, if you just wanna click, click and play, then you're probably better getting someone to just set it up for you properly. Um, and if I'm, if I'm totally honest, the people that are just gonna be hell bent on, I must have 4,000 megahertz memory, you're probably kind of missing the point anyway. And um, yeah, 3,200 is nice, 3,600 should be okay with most boards, 3,866 and above is where you're, you're either gonna get lucky or you're gonna to have to manually set up. But no matter what happens, the VCC IO and the system agent will need playing with once you get above 3200 megahertz. Some boards may be 3400 megahertz and above. It's gonna, it's gonna depend. So, talking about it, well, if you're gonna sit here and argue about, you know, six cores versus six cores, then, you know, yep, yeah, fair enough, absolutely fine. But there's one thing that you cannot get away from is the fact that six cores versus six cores, everything, the Intel is far and away quicker. But that is because of the clock speeds being massively different. The other thing is, is you do need to kind of consider that it's much more overclockable as well. So if we're getting five fairly easy, I'd think that most of you at home are gonna be looking at 4.8 to 4.9, even with limited abilities, as long as you can go in there and you know how to change your V-Core and you know how to set things up and look for temperatures and you've got a decent cooler. Temperatures, even with um, the volts that I was putting through, um, I, I was getting okay volts with the H110 IGT, which is what I used to uh, test it on. So they were all about 80 degrees. That was being absolutely smashed apart by benchmarks, really high draw benchmarks. And we were AVX stable as well because we do test in uh, prime 26, 28.1, 29.2, as well as OCCT, normal lin pack and with AVX enabled. So we test with all of that stuff. Now we'd normally be looking at um, VRM temps across all of the boards as well, but a lot of the boards aren't uh, not necessarily displaying, but telling the hardware info what the VRMs are at at the moment. But to be honest with you, I think you're gonna need a pretty, pretty bad board to get into any points where you might be having VRM issues because the, with the boards that we've seen so far with a maximum overclock being spanked apart, we've not really seen much above sort of 60, 65 degrees as far as v, uh, VRMs are concerned. It shouldn't be an issue. You're probably gonna end up feeling warmer chokes than anything else if they're low quality ones. The other thing when it comes to VRMs in the uh, Z370 platform, as with the Z270 platform, is you've not, in comparison to X299, X299 had to get the, all the VRMs in that tiny little bit at the top. Whereas with these, they kind of wrap around. It's almost like it's the wrong way round because the, you, they can spread the um, uh, VRMs out more on this. So you can have bigger heat sinks and you can spread them out in between more. But you can, do you know what I mean? You're not really limiting that one at the top. So the fact that you can spread them out means you can have a bigger heat sink and it should keep temps down. 
and it kind of has. But the other thing to keep in mind as well is it's not pulling anywhere near the same sort of power. And power is where the heat on the VRMs comes through. If we were to be able to force these systems, for argument's sake, to pull 500 watts, those VRMs would get really warm because they'd be feeding 500 watts worth of power. So the fact that even at overclocks, we were looking at 314 watts, that's almost half what I've been able to put through some of the X299 boards with those larger processors. So that is definitely something to keep in mind. Less power draw, less heat, it's all, it's all good. So yeah, um, as far as price is concerned, um, I think if, at the moment the 1800X is about 399, at least I looked at overclockers and it was 399. So I'm gonna go with around the kind of, Three seven um, three six nine to three fifty price, which is you know a rough kind of guess at the moment because as I've said we've not had anything kind of official. If it comes in less than the eighteen hundred X, it's clearly in almost everything, even at stock, being forced to sit with the the, the clock speed a little bit lower, it does outperform it. Um, uh, and in the the in the power draw graphs, as I've said. The, the 1800X would have downclocked itself. So if we were to then go in and run benchmarks at the speeds that the processors run themselves at during multi-core testing, then the, that's another one where the Intel does kind of open itself up even more because the AMD will do it to kind of save power and not create as much heat. It's almost the same as what the Intel stuff does when you hit it with AVX. And that was one of the things that, you know, before we were gonna force all that sort of stuff off. But anyway, or when you manually overclock it, you have to go and f it turns all that off. So, you know, as far as the 1800X is concerned, it's probably uh, as quick in the worst case scenario, but it is quicker in almost every other one. So even though it's got a couple of cores less, that extra bit of clock speed bump has made all the difference. I mean, when we think about it, we were kind of comparing the 7700K to the 1800X not that long ago. So banging another two cores on, it's only really gonna open that gap up even more. The fact that you can then overclock it even further just drives it even further on in front. Now that might not be what the AMD people wanna hear. And I'm still with you on, I'm not kind of 100%, you know, happy about the fact that it's technically the same architecture because with all due respect it is it's just you know a 7700k with a couple more cores on i don't know why they couldn't have planned for this at the start and had all those extra pins sat there waiting for the six cores so there are definitely two ways that you can swing about it it would have been nice if they thought about it a little while ago um and then but then again i kind of know why it wasn't thought about a little while ago and this is the bit I've been kind of saving because in the grand scheme of things what happened and this is genuinely what happened um, it was it there was a lot of rumors around the time that Ryzen come out but uh, when Ryzen did come out it wasn't the fact that Ryzen was performing you know it didn't shock Intel in in the way that a lot of people have kind of said it just didn't because although it was great and it did bring some of the market back, the reason why they bumped Coffee Lake forward was really because of the hatred that was going on. I don't think the socket change is really helping them, if I'm perfectly honest. I genuinely don't. But what they did do is they went to the engineers and they went, we want to bring Coffee Lake out in October. And the engineers went, we can't. The chipsets aren't ready. That's not the CPUs, it's the chipset. It's the Z370 chipset. So what they've done is the Z370 chipset is the Z270 chipset with a few changes to be able to take on those extra cores. Everything else is pretty much there. And if you go and compare the Z270 specs of the, what goes on with the chipset to the Z371, that's why they're so similar. There's no changes been added on. There's, do you know what I mean? You still happen to run um, extra, pro, do you know what I mean? extra things for USB 3.1 Gen 2. And it's all very, very similar because that's where it's come from. There's no extra PCI Express lanes on the chipset. There's no extra this, there's no extra that. And that's why next year, uh, in Q, maybe the start of Q3, you're gonna get the Z390 chipset. And that's where all that new stuff is gonna come in on. But that new chipset should have been January. And I kind of think that they should have just 
waited for January and done the job properly. Um, because at the, we're, there's also a lot of rumours going on as well that when the Z390 chipset comes out, that's when they're going to introduce the eight cores into this platform as well, or this product, and that's another reason why they needed all these extra pins. So I think they should have just waited it out and they should have just done it properly all at once. Now, it's still an absolute blinder of a product. It still does perform well, it still does overclock well. The fact that they've come in at around the sort of 7700K price point and moved all the cores up, I think that's epic. But there is still that questionable thing about did they sacrifice too much to be able to launch three months early? I kind of think they did. Um, and I think what they need to do is, I mean, the, all the people that are going to be shouting out and saying Intel are so bad and so this and so that, the, the problem is, is there's so many hell-bent fanboys that it's actually not helping matters anymore because so many people are just going on about it and on about it and on about it that people don't take any chuffing flipping i could use more fluent french notice of it anymore because it's almost expected um and if there was more kind of like decent you know level thought debate about these topics then they might actually sit in there and go oh yeah all right then but i'm one of them that thinks yeah it is a great cpu i don't know why you didn't just wait and do it properly though because Effectively, you, you, yeah, it, it, I mean, I first heard that they were going to change the um, board to 390 again in like February or March, and I was like, are you kidding me? They can't do it in six months, and now it's going to be about nine months. But the only good thing that I do have to say about this now is the way that's going to go, the chipset, all that's going to add is maybe more PCI Express lanes onto the chipset for more NVMe stuff. SATA is probably going to phase out now and you're almost going to end up using 2.5 inch solid state drives as like storage and everything's going to end up going M.2 and then maybe more connectivity on the back because I think with this generation of boards we did need more USBs on the back and we definitely need more internal USBs for things like, um, uh, like AIOs, power supplies and um, like RGB stuff. So that side of it, you know, I get. But if you have to go and buy a Z390 chipset then to be able to then run the eight cores, that's just gonna be bad. Now this is all hyper speculation because I don't know about it. It's just stuff that's being rumored. I mean, just the chipset side of things, I've been sat on for months uh, to see whether it was actually gonna be confirmed or not. And we've never really got any absolute confirmation on it, but do you know what I mean? I'm willing to put it in a review. so. You, that should be fair enough that I'm pretty confident about it. I'm probably going to end up in trouble about it as well, if I'm honest. Um, I'm amazed that none of the other big reviewers went with a massive kind of like, <gasps> did you know what they're doing? Maybe they will after I've said this. Anyway, so yeah, we will see. We will see. It's definitely a decent platform. There is no reason why not to buy it now because um, with all due respect, you're not going to wait nine months to go with the next one. And, you know, co connectivity things can kind of be got around. But like I said, I'm, I just hope and pray that you will be able to, if you wanted to, take your Z2, Z370 board and drop an 8-core in it, if that happens. But we do also need to remember, before everyone goes, oh, I'm not doing that because of the 8-cores, they've not actually mentioned 8-cores officially yet. And as I've said, this is an awful lot of speculation and I probably shouldn't have said anything about it because, like I said, it's, it's, it's still a bit, you know, will it happen, won't it? But then, boiling it all down, it is quick and I like the fact that um, it's coming at the 7700k prices because I think all of us expected it to be over the £400 mark, especially when you consider that at that £400 mark, even if it was 400 450 it would still be quite clearly quicker than the 1800x. But that's why I also said to you at the beginning that, yeah, it may be quicker than the 1800X, but it's that 1700 that's still the hidden bargain. And I don't get why people are buying the 1700X or the 1800X. I would personally, if you've got any sense, not bother with either. And crossing the lines between what I'm talking about in this video really isn't going to help matters that much. But anyway, so that is my, um, literally my brain fart dump about the coffee lake 
8700K. Don't forget what I said, go and have a look on the main channel because we've got a lot of motherboards up and there will be even more coming. I am also trying to get the 8600K, which is the non-hyper-threaded six core in for review as well. Intel did send me the normal i5 without overclocking, but if I'm perfectly honest with you, it's just like, why? I genuinely think they ordered the wrong one. Just get the K, not interested in the non-K, at least not now anyway. We need the, the this is a, you know what I mean? When we're talking about 200 pound boards and 200 plus pound boards, then yeah, we're not gonna be looking at the ones that are core fixed. So yes, anyway, that is me, done. Let me know what you think in the comments underneath. Go and take a look at the OC3D forums. There's also lots of links underneath for our social media, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, all of that. If you're interested, go and take a look. And I do seem to be doing a lot of uh, Facebook live streams on the Tiny Tom Logan page now as well. So if you're interested in the madness, I talk like this on there quite a lot.